welcome to the Lending Tree Bowl as part of Capital One Bowl Mania. A beautiful and brisk afternoon here along the Gulf Coast in Mobile, Alabama. The teams are ready. The table is set. Western Kentucky and Georgia State here in the Lending Tree Bowl this afternoon. So glad to have you here with us. I'm Mike Cousins. He's former NFL quarterback Jay Walker. And Don Davenport is, re is reporting on the sideline. Jay, to have made it to this point in the college football season is a test of perseverance. These teams have made it to the end. Yeah, quite simply, this is the reward for having made it through the 2020 college football season, not only physically, but mentally as well. When you have to replace a quarterback, that can be tumultuous. For Georgia State, that's not been the case with Cornelius Brown, better known as Quad. What a fantastic find it's been for Georgia State, led by the freshman quarterback, Cornelius Quad Brown. He has the ability to throw the ball deep and drive defenses crazy with his arm strength and his deceptiveness in the pocket. What you really like about Brown, for a quarterback that's six feet, five inches tall, he's got the ability to make defenders miss, extend the play with his legs, with his elusive speed. Cornelius Brown is that dude for Georgia State. A tremendous high school basketball player, football player as well. When he needs a go-to guy, it's Sam Pinckney. Yeah, keep it to the basketball theme. Sam Pinckney's a wide receiver, six feet, four inches, has the ability to make the very difficult catch over smaller defensive backs, but also what you have to like, the way he sets up his routes and the ability to be a home run hitter. What's a home run hitter? Make the difficult catch and finish off the play by having the speed to outrun the defensive back into the end zone. The Hilltoppers of Western Kentucky stumbled out of the gate. They come in having won three straight. Their strength is on the defensive side. A defense wins championships, as they like to say. I don't necessarily agree with it all the time, but if you're a Western Kentucky fan, you have to love the defense, particularly the defensive line. They control the line of scrimmage, whether it's the freshman sensation, Ricky Barber from his nose tackle position, or the all-conference defensive end, D'Angelo Malone. When it comes to Hilltoppers on defense, it starts with the defensive line, and that helps out the secondary when they can make opportunistic plays with the interception return like you see here. That's what defensive coordinator Clayton White said. That's why they've got so many pass breakups. It's why they allow less than 200 passing yards per game up there, not only in Conference USA, but among teams in all of FBS. Well, sometimes in life, the reward of something is just to finish. Completion is coronation. From Bowling Green, revving like Corvettes. From Atlanta, the home of college football. Hilltoppers, Panthers, next. Back in Mobile, just moments away from the start of Western Kentucky and Georgia State here in the Lending Tree Bowl. Let's go down to the field and check in with Don Davenport. Well, Mike, it's easy to overlook this Hilltopper offense. They come in averaging just 19 points a game, but something has clicked for them in the last two. They've scored a combined 75 points, and quarterback Tyrell Pigram has really settled in. It's been an up-and-down year for the Maryland grad transfer and learning a new offense. He was pulled from the starting lineup, and coaches told me that they've been so impressed with the way he fought and worked during that time. Head coach Tyson Helton said the big difference in his quarterback in the last few, his ability to find and make those explosive plays offensively. Guys, that's going to be the key for Western Kentucky here today. And for him, last game against Charlotte was his first of the year where he went over 200 yards passing. So we'll see if he can replicate that and perhaps do better today. It, it, it would make sense. I mean, this is a transfer that didn't have the opportunity of having spring football with this team. So he was learning the offense, went through his lumps, and it's good to see him play himself through it. And he's playing his best football of the season at the right time of year. Western Kentucky in the white tops, black pants. Georgia State in the blue tops and white pants. Western Kentucky wins the toss. They defer. So it's the Panthers of Georgia State who will start on offense. Notice how chippy it was before the kickoff. Both teams yapping at each other a little bit. They're excited to play. This is going to be a hard-fought contest. Sky is just about perfectly clear today. A little wind and some chill in the air to get this one going, the 22nd iteration of the Lending Tree Bowl. Quad Brown, the redshirt freshman from Birmingham, Alabama, leading this team to a five and four mark in the regular season. One of the best passers in the Sun Belt, a dual threat quarterback. And 6'5", 200 pounds. So just imagine this young man when he becomes a junior and a senior playing about 225 pounds, be able to run through more of the tackles. But he's got a lean frame, but he's got a cannon for a right arm and all the intangibles you'd like to see in a young quarterback. Amen. 
Design rollout on the first play. He tosses and throws it a little bit too far, looking for his top wide receiver, Sam Pinckney, incomplete on first down. And you can tell right away the game plan, get the football in Sam Pinckney's hands, try and get him some touches. Brown's second leading passer in the Sun Belt this year behind only Troy's Gunnar Watson. He brings Terrence Dixon in motion. Brown on the move. He's cut down after a gain of about a yard and a half. So already for a defense that gets after the quarterback with ease, a third and long on the opening drive. And that's what you want. That's going to be the key. Who controls the line of scrimmage? Western Kentucky expects to do that. And you put your quarterback in third long situations. Watch out for number 10. At the top of your screen, in the man line of scrimmage, he likes to chase the quarterback. D'Angelo Malone, 25 sacks, the school record, and the pass over the middle is incomplete. So a sputtering start for the Georgia State offense. Well, the staff says there's Sean Elliott, the head coach. There's not a lot of stress-free plays in this offense for Quad Brown meaning he's got to make decisions on every single play. It's not just drop back. I know exactly where I'm going to go. That's a stressful beginning. So inside the 25, the starting field position for Western Kentucky, led by Tyrell Pigram Jay, who's had quite a journey from the start of his career in 2016 to today. Yeah, started off at the University of Maryland and played in some crucial games there. Very competitive, hardworking guy this season. Look at that. As a quarterback, I don't care if it's against air. Nine touchdowns, zero interceptions on the season. That's efficient at the quarterback position. And interestingly enough, with no interceptions, Brian Ellis, the offensive coordinator, said for this team, I may be the only offensive coordinator in the country who wishes his quarterback had thrown at least one interception this year. Well, they want to be a little bit more aggressive with the downfield passing and take some chances. They hand it off to Gage Walker, who picks up about four yards on first down. A redshirt senior running back out of Tampa. You see the numbers there, the 1,400 yards, that 9-0 to zero touchdown interception ratio is great. But when you watch him on film, he does leave some receivers open downfield. He really likes to throw the ball in the intermediate passing game, 5 to 7 yards downfield. Hey, the coach gives you the green light to go deep. Go for it, quarterback. Let's see if he does it today. His birthday this week, back on Tuesday, turned 23 years old and back in his home state as well. The native of Birmingham. Pocket collapses on Pigram. He slips out. He keeps things moving and then throws incomplete. But great survivability by Pigram to not take the sack. And you saw a little bit of the competitive nature that the coaches say that he has. Refusing to go down. Good job of getting to the pocket, but you have to be able to bring him down. And number 59, Thomas Gore not able to do it. Towards the end, he throws it. But you saw the athleticism and the strength of Pigram on that play. When he struggled to complete those longer throws this year, he doesn't see the receivers. How can they fix that? He's got to work with his vision, keep his eyes downfield. He's got a little bit of happy feet, as we used to call it back in the day. He's got to settle, trust his pocket, know the protection, and don't get distracted by the things happening around you. Just a three-man rush. It's Pigram on the move. He throws deep downfield, and that falls incomplete. That could have wow. been a six-point play for Western Kentucky, and it ends up as nothing. Yeah, they were able to sneak C.J. Jones deep behind the defender, and that's one of those throws where if you set your feet and just step into it and launch it, that would have been a pig play, quite possibly a touchdown for Western Kentucky, but a missed opportunity. Quavian White is back to receive at the 25 on the punt from John Haggerty. And that takes a left turn out of bounds at the 30-yard line. Opening drives, nothing doing for Western Kentucky and Georgia State. Panthers when we come back on offense. Next game up on ESPN, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific is the Cure Bowl. Liberty and Coastal Carolina. And Jay, this game 
for good reason, is perhaps one of the most anticipated of the entire bowl season. Very successful football campaigns for these teams. One team thinks they can score points, while the other team thinks they can score more. You like to run it, they like to run it. You like to stop people from scoring, they stop people from scoring. It's going to be a heavyweight fight tonight. Combined records of 20 and 1 in that game. The only loss for Liberty against NC State. Powerful run on first down, 13 yards on the handoff to Tucker Gregg, the junior from Chatsworth, Georgia. Strong finish to the season for him. Ran for three touchdowns against South Alabama here in Mobile, not too far from here at the on-campus stadium. And this throw yields even better results for Georgia State. With the extra effort, taking the ball all the way down to the 25-yard line to, for Cornelius McCoy. Yeah, running backs hit him with a big run. They crept the safeties down for run support. Quad Brown recognized it, delivered a strike to Cornelius McCoy. And the Panthers are quickly right back to the line, trying to catch the defense off guard before they can catch their breath. Hand off to Greg, and they lose a yard. And, and that's the risk that they're going to have to try and do. So on the previous play to get down here, once you see the safeties coming to the screen, nobody in the middle of the field, accurately thrown ball, and way to run after catch by McCoy. They are playing a lot of man-to-man -man coverage. That puts so much pressure on your secondary to be able to cover. If you're going to play that much man, you better be able to get to the quarterback. Brown on the option. Ball comes loose, and Greg falls on top of it. A dangerous play, quickly smothered by the running back waiting on it. And for the second time in as many drives, Georgia State score, faces a third and long. The indecisive. Once you make that decision to run, run. You can't pitch it late. You already made the decision to run the football. Dangerous pitch. Fortunate that Tucker Gregg was there to land on the football. Sean Elliott's team averaging 33 points a game, the most in this program's brief history. They spread it out five wide, a draw for Brown up the middle. And he sets up first and goal, Georgia State. When you play man-to-man -man coverage like Western Kentucky's doing, you don't put anybody to guard the quarterback. He recognizes this. There's nobody to stop me from running the football, picking up the first down easily. If they don't disguise that look a little bit more, you're going to see more play calls like that. Three wide out to the right. And Greg gets maybe a yard as he tests the waters up the middle. And that's Nick Days coming in from his linebacker position, number five. The sophomore from Miami, Florida. Talk about what a bright future he has. His future may be as bright as those chrome helmets from Western Kentucky. Those are sharp, huh? Oh, they're tight. Love them. Good fits for the end of the year. Well, trying to run straight up the middle against this defensive line, unless it's that five-wide quarterback draw, that's the strength of this defense. Yeah, trying to run into the teeth of the defense and just you won't have a lot of success if you continue to do that. But schematically, I think that's going to be the challenge for the offensive coordinator, Brad Glenn. Schematically, how do we get them to loosen up and just put one person in the box where we can gain the advantage in the number count? Third and goal, Georgia State on their second drive of the afternoon. Brown looking to throw. He backpedals, heaves, and that ball is tipped and intercepted. Western Kentucky comes up with the takeaway. Devin Key, major key. That's their recipe. That's what we talked about in the open. When the defensive line brings pressure, it allows the secondary an opportunity to make big plays. And what a good stand by this defense from Western Kentucky coming up with the interception. You see, it was the pressure trying to escape, put a hit on the quarterback, inaccurate throw, and a great job by Devin Key to haul it in. The career tackling leader on the defense for Western Kentucky in their FBS history. And they take over first and 10 from the 20. Here's Pigram throwing from the shotgun. And a nice tackle to come up at the line of scrimmage and bring that play to a close as Dayton Wade was the man in motion and he's cut down, gains maybe a yard. Yeah, what a fantastic play by Antavius Lane, number 34, from that safety position. 
open field tackle. If he doesn't make that tackle, that's a huge play for Western Kentucky. But instead, it was a hard lick put on by Lane. Well, his nickname is Hit Stick, and for good reason, because of his ferocious tackling ability. Big Room in his second college bowl game. His first was back at the University of Maryland real early on. They swing it to the outside. The completion is to Dakota Thomas, who until last game hadn't recorded any offensive stats. So his career has come on in earnest here at the end of his freshman season. Yeah, true freshman, and he's been a spark in that offense. They gave him credit for some of the offensive points they've been able to put on the board the past two weeks. And See if he can come up with a play here on third and short. Pigram at quarterback, the ability to run and elude a defense. Walker off to his right in the backfield. And it's Pigram with the carry. And with his initial burst through the line, appears to have enough for the first down. And he does. Just enough. Now that you got a fresh set of downs, be a good time to get Gage Walker involved in the offense. They're running back, who's been their bell cow all season long. And if you're going to plan on running the football a little bit to ease some of the pressure off Pegram, I'd get number five of the football in the backfield. Walker at running back started out his career in the defensive backfield as a cornerback and a couple of years ago made the move to running back. He takes the handoff here, lowers the shoulders forward out across the 35-yard line. A good pickup there on first down. So you do that and you start getting some rhythm with your offensive line. Seth Jost, the center. Jordan Meredith, the right guard. Mason Brooks. Some of those guys they say are some of the better players up front. Get them involved. See if they can force their will against this three-man defensive line from Georgia State. It's a very cohesive front five for Western Kentucky. Starters in the middle at the guard spots and center have started every game over the last three seasons for the Hilltoppers. Pigram flings it downfield way too long for Dakota Thomas, who had single coverage. And beyond that, a couple of steps on Jalen Jones. Yeah, we're seeing the freshman Thomas, he's going to be a problem because he's got the ability to separate. Nice size, 6'1", 200 pounds. That's one where Pigram just got to set his feet a little bit more relaxed. And that's when we talk about the deep throws. Get comfortable in the pocket and deliver an accurate throw. You're only going to get so many chances at that deep home run ball but there's no point trying to do it if you don't have balance and confidence in your throw. Third down and five, a lot of motion along the defensive line for Georgia State. Seventh in FBS in sacks. The pocket holds up and the pass to the 45 yard line complete for the first down for Western Kentucky. Pick up on that play of 11 from Pigram. Good job by the offensive line up front protecting the quarterback. Look at this clean pocket. That's a clean pocket, but awkward throwing motion, throwing off that front leg. That's what we talk about. He's got to get more comfortable with his delivery and settle those feet down a little bit. Just calm him down a little bit, and he could be a much more effective passer. Big Grim with the handoff for Walker. Five yards on first down for the red shirt senior. And this offensive line, not only in the middle, but with every spot except for right tackle, the other four offensive linemen have all started at least 30 games in their careers. Very experienced, and particularly that left tackle, Cole Spencer, number 70, the voice of the bunch, the vocal leader and three-year starter, and he's just a junior. Here goes Pigra, first down yardage and then some. And he gives himself up inside the 40-yard line. A very speedy dozen for the quarterback. Yeah, what a fantastic play. Great job of faking the handoff, pulling it, making the right decision, then putting a juke move on Ja'Cory Crawford, number 10, picks up the first down and showing you that he's got a little bit of wiggle at that quarterback position. Well, so far, the much lower scoring offense among these two teams has appeared to be the more efficient. Western Kentucky, the lowest scoring team in Conference USA at just 19 points a game. 
Pigram's got time, an awkward shovel. Gets past the line of scrimmage, but not much further. And there have not been too many throws, that one included, that have looked all too pretty for Pigram so far. No, he's not getting any style points. But, I mean, the key is, and you understand he's a little bit nervous because this Georgia State, the one thing they do do well defensively is get to the quarterback coming into tonight's game. 32 sacks on the season, but have not been able to wrestle down Pigram yet. And an injured Panther, that's Ja'Cory Crawford, the linebacker, temporarily halts the sustained drive for Western Kentucky. The Lending Tree Bowl, brought to you by Lending Tree. Shop and compare loans, credit cards, insurance, and more. And cheese it cheesy, crunchy satisfaction. Pleasure to have you with us here in Mobile, Alabama for the second Lending Tree Bowl of 2020 with the first taking place January 6th of this year. So just 345 days apart. Western Kentucky and Georgia State in the second this year. Tenth play of this sustained drive for Western Kentucky. Ja'Cory Crawford, the linebacker for Georgia State, was the injured player that forced the stoppage in play. Pigram on the run, okay. throws downfield, and it's nearly intercepted. It was as easy a takeaway as there might be this season for Chris Moore, and it went right through his hands. You have to make that play, Mike. You've got to make that play. Everything was there. They made a nice break on the ball, sees it clearly. He's the best person in position to make that play, and Chris Moore just not able to come down with it. And you see Pigram also got roughed up a little bit, but he's very fortunate to have a third down. Third and nine, Western Kentucky got the ball to start this drive on their own 20 after an interception in the end zone. Pressure comes, Pigram lets it fly and it goes out of bounds. There you see the ferocity of this defense, top 10 and number one in the, in the Sun Belt in sacks this year. Yeah, it showed up, Akeem Smith 97 followed by number seven, Jordan Strawn. You think you're getting outside the pocket? Look at the blue jersey swarming to the football. Pigram does a good job just getting rid of it. But that was a good pass rush by the blue jerseys of Georgia State. Well, they're into plus territory at the 38-yard line. Fourth and nine, you like this call? Yeah, I thought it was two down territory prior to the previous play. Now maybe go for one of these 50-50 balls, take a deep shot, just like a punt. Pressure comes, Pigram lets it go, pass is complete. It's right at That's the sticks. Close. Seems like the official on the other sideline is saying forward progress. They're moving the chains yep. for the first down. And there's not even going to be a question about it. They get 10 yards when they needed nine to keep the drive going. See the time it gets rid of this football. Watch the hit. Coming up by the defensive back, that's a good job by the DB driving through Jalen Jones, driving through the receiver. No yield from the third year starter at cornerback. Design oh. run for Pigram and his throw back. to the end zone. And it's a touchdown for Western Kentucky. And it is holding on Western Kentucky as well. That's a, coming back. In a major and <laughs> obvious way with the flag down at the 32. 10-yard penalty, replay first down. And that was the running back, Gage Walker, trying to block Jordan Strong with the penetration. They were trying to roll him out of the pocket. And you'll see right here on your edge, number five, a little bit of a takedown there. Once that happens, you see the referee right there throwing the flag immediately, taking away what would have been a big play for Western Kentucky. So the touchdown to Malachi Corley is erased, and it backs up the Hilltoppers. That's the 36-yard line. Make it first and 20. And they call timeout. Timeout. Western Kentucky. This is their first timeout they have. 30-second timeout. 
A team that stumbled out of the gate. They lost four of their first five, but they did close out strong, as Don mentioned right before kickoff with their scoring over the last couple of games, Jen. You can see those flashes of potential, but also understand why on the season, They've only averaged 19 points a game, which was in the bottom 20 of college football. And considering they've got such a good offensive line, the head coach Tyson Helton realizes the defense is good, but the offense has to pick it up. And I think it's just a matter of time before they come together in jail. They're going to make some changes offensively with their schematics for the upcoming season. But however, right now they're trying to win this football game today. So essentially doubling their scoring average for the season over those final three games. And if you want to look close at those numbers, I mean, if the defense is going to score three touchdowns for you, that's going to help. Offense gets right. credit for it, so they're better. But let's see if they can put it all together here today in Mobile. Inside five minutes to go in the opening quarter. Big drop back, Pigram downfield, pass completed the five, a dive at the goal line, and it's marked out of bounds short of the end zone. Complete for 34 to set up first and goal, Western Kentucky. And that's the tight end, Josh Simon. He looks like a wide receiver with his speed, but he's 6'5", 240 pounds, able to get behind the linebacker. Clearly a little bit short there, but just a sophomore, and he is a true NFL talent playing for Western Kentucky. And an eagle eye from the linesman on that play because on the replay we just saw, it looked like Simon's foot was out of bounds there. But it's going to go upstairs. The replay room will get a look at it to see where the ball was as he stepped out of bounds. Seems like he steps out of bound on the two yard line maybe and the ball may be on the one yard line. So I anticipate this ball will be spotted about the one yard line maybe. But what a play, what a good job of getting open by Simon. The sophomore from Dalzell, South Carolina. Nifty moves, turns and steps for the pylon. What are you seeing there, Mike? Yeah, I think the call on the field is exactly right. You'd need indisputable video evidence to overturn the call on the field. I think it's pretty clear he stepped out of bounds there, and that's what the call was made on the field. But Simon, you mentioned his future. He's a really charismatic guy. <laughs> he's been on their radio show throughout the week before, and just hearing him talk, he's got amazing personality, a very vibrant guy, and that's the type of player in a season like this where you spend so much time with each other and so little time with just about anybody else. You need somebody like that to keep the pep up. Yep, keep the energy up, and what the coaches describe him, just a good old country kid. After review, the ruling on the field stands. First and goal. So nothing convincing enough to change things, but Simon with a nice grab. Sets up first and goal, two yard line here for WKU, looking for the game's first score. 14th play of this drive that started with an interception in the opposite end zone. They were backed up, had a first and 20 on this drive, and now just two yards away. They like to bring 48 across the formation and use him as a lead blocker. Here comes Wachuski. The tight end helps lead the way for Tyrell Pigram, unimpeded into the end zone. Come on, come on. Impressive drive. Ate up a lot of clock against a very potent, high powered scoring offense, and Pigram able to cap it off. And Braden Narvison is on for the extra point. He's been perfect this year. Seven nothing, WKU. Josh Simon thought he might have reached pay dirt, was out at the two, and Tyrell Pigram capped off the drive.
This is Capital One Bowl Mania. And we're bowling in Mobile, Alabama. A 14 play, 80 yard touchdown drive for Western Kentucky. Has them on the board first. Mike Cousins, Jay Walker, Don Davenport, glad to be with you. Yeah, let's go back to this touchdown. And we identified Steven Wichowski, Wichowski, the lead blocker. He's going to be your lead. He comes across the formation. And once he does that, he seals the edge, making it an easy walk in the park. And how about this for Wachowski? He was named the captain for today's bowl game. Won't show up in the stat sheet, but he did a great job sealing the edge. Validating that selection by the coaching staff. And now it's up to the Georgia State offense to try and find an equalizer here after the fair catch on the kickoff. They start from their own 25-yard line. Well, we saw Tucker Gregg on the opening drive. And we'll see some Destin Coates as well. Their leading rusher this year. Just a shade over 650 yards, about 80 yards a game, second in the league behind only Elijah Mitchell of Louisiana. And what you really like about Coates, all-purpose back. Can pass protect, can catch the ball out of the backfield, can run between the tackles. Good solid runners, as we saw in that play just now. What the coaching staff did say relative to Coates was that turnovers had been an issue as of late, and perhaps that's why you saw Greg taking the opening carries on the first drive. You get the feeling it's going to be one of those hot hand things where the coaches give a drive here, a drive there, and then see who they like for the rest of the game. Tight ends Payne and Carter relocate from right to left. On the third down and short, and the powerful run guts the defense up the middle and gets a Georgia State first down. And a little bit of get to see the explosiveness, the quick first step by Coates as he accelerates through the hole. Good job by Pat Bartlett, number 64, playing that right guard position with the seal and Malik Sumter. And big hole in the middle of that defense. Brown, the flick of the wrist sends it downfield and over the head of Cornelius McCoy. So we've seen both Brown and Pigram go a little bit too long in single coverage. Yeah, settle down, make those throws. And that's gonna be the recipe. If you get a one-on-one -on -one matchup, you have to make a team pay. So if a team's gonna play man-to-man -man coverage and crowd the line of scrimmage, if you don't hurt them with some deep shots, then it's gonna be a long day. On this play, two safeties back deep. And the throw goes underneath and incomplete. It's now going to be third down and 10 for Brown in the offense. And what the game plan coming in was get the ball to Sam Pinckney. They came out with the first attempt, got on the football, but since then, it seems as if Sean Elliott's offense has kind of gotten away from that. Third down situation, I'm looking for number 15 if he's one on one. Offense spent a lot of time on the sidelines after a six-minute drive from Western Kentucky. Brown's going to run, but he doesn't have enough for the first down. He's ankle tackled two yards short of midfield, fourth and two, and let's see what they do now. Kick it. I know you're in a bowl game, but I think you kick in this situation here. You're on your side of the 50-yard line. And see, Brown comes up short, but... Timeout, Western Kentucky, their second of the opening quarter. Timeout, Western Kentucky. This is their second timeout of the half. 30-second timeout. And, and the reason why I say you kick it here is you know that Western Kentucky struggles to score points offensively. If they get a stop right now from the defense, this is a defensive assist. You're giving an offense that has struggled great field position with an opportunity to put you down by two scores. I think you punt it and make Western Kentucky show that they can drive the ball you know, 80, 90 yards on you again. And certainly you combine that with how effective Georgia State's defense has been this year. That's a pretty good combination to put those two things up against one another for Georgia State. Yeah, but getting caught up in the emotion. Maybe after this timeout, maybe they're going to decide to go for the hard count, see if you can get them to jump off sides, pick up the first down. But 48-yard line down by seven. Aggressive play selection here by... Head coach Sean Elliott, if they do decide to go for it. Mm -hmm. 
So fourth down and two for Georgia State. On the pitch, a dangerous toss back, but they do pick up the first down. Destin Coates reaching back, thundering forward, and the drive marches on. Wow, that was really good defense by Western Kentucky, but just better offense by Georgia State. They've got bodies there. Oh, might have got away with a little block in the back from the wide receiver position there. But pretty good execution by the Panther offense. After a long gander over toward the sideline, a handoff for about two yards. And you know what's been interesting, Jay, looking at this Georgia State offense this year, is that Roger Carter, the tight end, who last year had an absolutely prolific season from that spot, really has not come close to matching those numbers this year. And yet, they've still maintained a high scoring attack at 33 points a game. They've got weapons, you know, the emergence of a Freshman quarterback stepping up, and Pinkney's really established himself as that go-to guy. So they've kind of shifted the focus from a tight end base offense to it's all centered around Sam Pinkney in the running game. Brown with a dart across the middle, complete for the first down. Jamari Thrash makes just his eighth catch of the year, but a big one. He picks up 19 yards. And that's a quad Brown special. And when he pulls the ball out of the stomach, if that backside slant is there, he is going to throw the ball. And sometimes to the staff chagrin, even if the receiver's not open. <laughs> even if not open, he's going to stick it. That's Coates plowing his way through that potent defensive line to give them a first down at the 12 after a gain of 12. Good job by the offense after achieving the fourth down and two at midfield, continuing to move the ball, building some momentum. Greg and Coates flanking Brown in the backfield. A run up the middle, a slip tackle, and a Georgia State touchdown. Eleven yards on the slippery scamper from Destin Coates. They're an extra point away from tying it up. We mentioned if Coates can hold on to the football, he's a pretty special runner. And that was a really good job by the offensive line up front for Georgia State. Those were some huge holes towards the end of that drive. Extra point coming from Noel Ruiz. And we are knotted at seven. You see that big hole to run through, then a good job by Coates of finishing off the run. That's what separates the men from the boys. The good ones will get you close. The better ones punch it in. They only played nine games this year, went five and four, four and four in the Sun Belt. But in those nine games, Destin Coates had four 100-yard games this season. And you see Coach Elliott there talking to his bunch there. You can hear talking to him. You ask coach, what does this game mean to you? He said, second consecutive year going to a bowl game for a program that most of America is just starting to learn about. He definitely has this program trending in the right direction. When we talk about Georgia State, I mean, I told him, I think they're one of the most, they're one of the hottest schools in the country. The, now the largest institution in the state of Georgia, enrollment wise, new facilities. Football team's pretty good, too. It's a pretty good combination. Playing at the former Turner Field for a long time, the home of the Atlanta Braves. A short kick returned out almost to the 35-yard line. After that Georgia State touchdown, let's go down to Dawn. Mike, this Georgia State sideline needed that score, the gutsy call, and then punch it in for the touchdown. And Sean Elliott, you guys just mentioned him. Oh, this guy is full of energy, and you feel it here on the sideline. I loved hearing about Coach Elliott from his players, uh, even one who said they didn't get along early on. Now he loves and respects him. But here's a quote for you guys, okay, as you see Coach Elliott jumping around. He is a great motivator. Just looking at him makes you want to run through a wall. I like uh -oh. it. 
Oh, you can tell. He's enthusiastic. And that player was, I think it was Blake Carroll. Said we Correct. Faced the butt head, the starting inside linebacker. And that's when you know you've got a little coach swag. When, when you can say, hey, I didn't get along with the kids so much. However, it's not about me. It's about these young men. And, hey, they've got a good one down there at Georgia State. And one of the perks of an empty stadium, you can hear them coming out of the tunnel before the game. A-T-L-A. And they're ready to go. 7-7 seven, seven after one in Mobile. Six days to the college football playoff semifinals. Move your day on ESPN. Welcome back to the Lending Tree Bowl as part of Capital One Bowl Mania. Mike Cousins, Jay Walker, Don Davenport. We are wearing formal clothes today, so you don't have to enjoy this game, hopefully with some family, friends, and if not that, at least a lot of food. I'm just glad that our clothes still fit after how much I ate the last couple of days. Would you have an extra piece of chicken, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> a few. So 7-7 seven, seven after a quarter and just underway in quarter number two. Western Kentucky out of Conference USA and Georgia State out of the Sun Belt. Both teams came up empty on their opening drives and then each put together drives of at least 75 yards to get on the board. This is a big play right now for Western Kentucky. They need to hold on to this football because Georgia State on defense is starting to feel themselves a little bit. Pigram, the grad transfer from Maryland. Deeks his way away from one defender. Now off the back foot. <laughs> Throws incomplete. And we've seen from both Quad Brown, the freshman, and Tyrell Pigram, the grad transfer, some dangerous throws as they're just trying to get the plate over with. Yeah, it's been awkward. But, and I think it goes back to what Don talked about on her hit. After they went for it on that fourth down, you can tell Coach Elliott's squad just kind of built off his energy. And it's carried over. The offense finished off the drive and scored. Defense started getting after it again. And now all of a sudden, Georgia State's done a good job of kind of taking over momentum in this football game. Flag comes in and a procedural call against Western Kentucky. Ball start, number 36 of the offense. Five yard penalty remains fourth down. Doesn't seem to be much of a problem for John Haggerty, their punter, the senior from Sydney, Australia, averaging 46 yards a kick this year. That's a Western Kentucky record. That's a penalty. All sorts of chaos. And that ball takes a bounce at the 40. How is that not a penalty for too many people on the field? Or a legal substitution? Now, Haggerty, as he walks off, is wondering the exact same thing with his palms to the sky. They're going to make him kick it again. I mean, yeah, so they see it, but there's nobody over the ball. Then the official's coming in there to stop him to say, you have to give him a chance to substitute. I would love for you to do the telestrator number thing on that, <laughs> oh, but I don't, know if, I don't know if the numbers go that high. Well, you can be sure that Haggerty would like another shot at that punt anyway. <laughs> as it only was down inside the 40. There's another flag, so hang tight. As that's fair caught at the 29-yard line. But the flag sits at the 30-yard line. There's some movement on Georgia State, I'm pretty sure. Five-yard penalty remains fourth down. This is the down that never ends. <laughs> Punted for the third time here for Haggerty. So his first punt kind of shanked it a little bit. Second punt, he booted it. Right. Now what's he doing the third one? So the return man was already staying in Quavion White. He's moved up five yards. So he made the fair catch at the 30. Now he's on the 35. Well, he's kicking into the wind a little yeah. bit. Because almost 40% of his kicks this year have gone for more than 50 yards. Well, you can tell that the wind has hampered the aerodynamic capacity of the ball coming off his foot. All right, and we got the, the <laughs> median <yards. laughs> of the three punts right in between the 30 and the 35. A punt of 40 yards for John Haggerty.
Welcome back to the Lending Tree Bowl. We're here in Mobile, Alabama, Western Kentucky, and Georgia State, even at seven. College football playoff semifinals are New Year's Day, ESPN, and the app. It'll be number one, Alabama, number four, Notre Dame, with the Rose Bowl at AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas, and then number two, Clemson, number three, Ohio State, in the Sugar Bowl, with the winners playing for the national championship Monday, January 11th on ESPN. Our Progressive Bowl Challenge Cup will be awarded to the conference that has the highest winning percentage in the postseason and a chance for Georgia State to help the Sun Belt get to 3-0 and if they pick up a win today. Look at the Fun Belt. The Fun Belt 2-0. and Big game coming up after us from another Sun Belt representative with Coastal. Coastal Carolina and Liberty in the Cure Bowl tonight, 7.30 here on ESPN. One of the most highly anticipated matchups of the bowl season. That was close to happening in the regular season. <laughs> that then gave us Coastal BYU instead. Which was a great game. Yes, one of the best and, of the regular and, season. And to tell you, I've seen them up close. I'm sticking with the mullets. Coastal Carolina, <laughs> the mullets, oh, they, real deal. Georgia State five and four in the regular season, four and four in Sunbelt play. 33 points a game on offense for this squad. And to get to a bowl game, Jay, we talked about this right from the very beginning of the broadcast today. It is an act of perseverance to have made it this far to A, have a team healthy enough to play to this point, but also a team that still has the desire to play at this point, because it's, we saw it at first with Boston College, and then several other teams followed it in the wake of that, of saying, thanks, but you know what? We'd like to go back to life being a little bit more normal, and we're going to pass on bowl season. Brown looking to throw, surveying his secondary and tertiary options, and he connects with Cornelius McCoy for a first down. And that was a good job by Brown and the offensive line, giving him the time to read on the left side of the field and then come back, throw all the way back across. Man to man coverage, good job of separating by McCoy, winning that battle. A plunge forward for eight for Tucker Gregg on first down. And the follow-up on that point you said, I mean, with the college football season, the fact that these teams were disciplined enough to have semi-successful seasons and to be rewarded with this bowl game in spite of all the distractions and games being called. There's three flags that came in, a triangulation of flags on the play. Ball start. Number two, the offense. Five yard penalty. Remains second down. And this is a sport that has some chest thumping to it, some machismo, right? Cool. And so Sean Elliott said, you know what? In our locker room, there was never any thought of anybody opting out of this, somewhat critically of the teams that did, I think. But I don't know, do you think that there should be criticism of teams that didn't want to play any further? No, uh, if, if your health is, if you don't have your health, what do you have? And, you know, if you've got so many things where you don't have enough bodies to go out there, then you understand that, you know, why put people in jeopardy? So I think the, the real will look back in the fall and then we'll see because this is going to be a quick turnaround period. Yeah, Coach Elliott also pointed out, hey, this football program's only 11 years old. Back-to-back -back bowl games is pretty special for them. I talked to a bunch of their players this week, and they said, look, we've only played nine games this year. We came here to play football, and this is a pretty tight-knit group, guys. They wanted one more game together. Who, who's talking the most trash down there on the sidelines? <laughs> I can't tell if it's Western Kentucky or is it Georgia, Georgia State. Well, Quad Brown should be after a Mahomes-esque throw to get rid of that ball. The release to Aubrey Payne. And now they're getting to do hurry up. This is what Georgia State wants to do. Hurry up offense, keep you on your heels. Brown rolling. Incomplete as he was going for a thrash. Those two connected earlier. And it's second and ten. They love Brown's ability to be able to get out and run. And Sean Elliott told us earlier this year that when he saw him play in high school, not football, high school basketball, that's when he felt like he knew that he was going to be not only capable, but really a skilled technician to run this style of offense. Just simply the way that he ran the floor in basketball. 
a hard collision brings that end, brings that run to an end on the outside for Jemiast Williams. A gain of 13, his first touch today for the former South Carolina Gamecock. And big hit by Roger Cray, number 24, filling, playing the cornerback position. Ooh, a little bit above the shoulder path. Pass fortunate wasn't a penalty. They loaded up to the left side. Here goes Williams, the speediest of this running back trio. He's collapsed upon by the defense at the 25-yard line. Back-to-back -back huge runs as that one gets 20. Yep, and so they ran the option on the outside. Now you see the guys just winning their battles on the line of scrimmage. Good job of seeing the hole by Williams. Ten and a half to go in the second quarter, even at seven. Brown feeds Greg, and he's swarmed and sent backwards. Look at big Jalen Madden. 6'1", 310-pound nose guard, and you can tell that tackle there had a little extra oomph on it. Okay, you guys have had some big runs, and nose tackles take it personal when you run the ball in the middle of the defense. Native of Tuscaloosa, the redshirt senior, back in his home state. Look at the end zone. It's caught for a touchdown by Sam Pinckney. 26 yard connection from Quad Brown. Man to man coverage. Sam Pinckney's going to show you. He's a difference maker. Great job. Gave him a little stutter go. And when they fell for that, Perfectly placed ball by Quad Brown. Hit him in stride. Watch out for that fence. He has a touchdown after the play. Unsportsmanlike conduct, number two of the offense. That penalty would be enforced on the kickoff. It's the wide receiver, Jamari Thrash. So that's the second unsportsmanlike conduct penalty flag thrown in the second quarter. We had one at the end of that interminable punt as well on the third time that set Georgia State back to begin this drive. We saw that single coverage opportunity there earlier. Brown had an overthrow the first time he had that look. This time he didn't miss and it ends up with a Panthers touchdown. Yeah, perfectly thrown ball. And once you read the coverage and throw it to the right person, as a quarterback, you know what you feel like? Oh, yeah, I'm the man. 14-7. The Lending Tree Bowl, brought to you by Lending Tree. Shop and compare loans, credit cards, insurance, and more. Bill Curry helped get the Georgia State program off the ground. Jack Harbaugh, head coach at Western for 14 seasons. Division I AA title in 02. Jeff Brom, Willie Taggart, among others. Now Tyson Helton at the helm in year number two. He took over after Mike Sanford Jr. had a brief stint in Bowling Green, Kentucky, just two seasons. And uh, it's impressive what he's done so far, getting his team into back-to-back -back bowls. They beat Western Michigan last year. And usually when you take over after a coach has been fired, the success doesn't come quite as quickly as it has so far for Western Kentucky. They take the kickoff after a Georgia State touchdown, and they'll start at the 40, but some injury news from Georgia State. Let's go down to Dawn. Yeah, guys, Sam Pinckney, after that touchdown, came off the field limping on the left ankle and went straight into the injury tent. They taped it up. He came limping out, but he did have a big smile on his face. I don't think he's going anywhere. Taped it up tight and ready to go. Don, I'm going to tell you, they need him. I mean, period. He's that guy. One of the leading receivers in the Sun Belt this year was injured at the end of last season and ran into that wall. That's maybe six or seven yards beyond the back boundary of the end zone. So the Birmingham, Alabama native, Tyrell Pigram gets this drive started with a check down throw. And first down yardage and a flag from the backside at the end of the play. A pickup of 13 for the Hilltoppers. 
C.J. Jones made the catch, and we'll see what kind of yardage. Holding number 14 in the offense, 10 yards from the spot of the foul, remains first down. It's Therese Trainer, the redshirt sophomore wide receiver, who sends the Hilltoppers back. And you'll see Trainer at the end of the run, the hole, a little bit unnecessary. So they're backed up to first and 20. Pigram keeps it. A capable runner on the roll. Takes the option right in front of him. And that's the tight end, Steven Wachowski, who helped lead the way for a Pigram touchdown run earlier. Yeah, and Wachowski's having a great day. So he did a great job. He was named captain for this football game. It's his first catch of the year. First catch of the year, and he's got a block, so. Coach, I've been here all season. Why are you just now using me? Good job getting open in the flat. And you love it when you see those fullbacks catch the ball. Look at him. He's all smiles over there on the sideline talking to his boys. After the penalty, they got six yards back on that one. Walker on the screen. And he's got them out toward midfield, a first down. Back-to-back -back plays to Florida products, 15 for Tampa's Gage Walker. And a great call against an aggressive defensive line. Look at the penetration. You know they're thinking about the sacks. They forgot. Screen pass. Gage Walker picks up the yards and a big first down for Western Kentucky. I was wondering when we were going to see a screen pass against an aggressive defensive line. They're thinking sack, sack, sack. Will you slip in a running back behind them and you can gouge them? And we just saw the Hilltoppers do that. So they found the necessary antidote. And a long throw over the middle for Pigram. And that ball is taken away. Antavius Lane with the interception, his fourth of the season. And the Panthers regain control. Sticking with that Florida theme, Lane is from Florida, the red shirt freshman, and he makes a great break on the ball. This is how you play defensive back. When the ball's in the air, go get it. Good job of just wanting that ball and coming up with a huge INT. So they take over at the 23-yard line, getting the ball right back, an offense that's been heating up after an 82-yard touchdown drive. Last time they held it. Brown, look downfield, check down for Terrence Dixon. A nice pickup for the redshirt junior, who's a small guy, only 5'7", 170, but he can be elusive against defenders. First interception of the season, that's right, coming into today's game. he gone almost 280 throws without throwing an interception. That streak is over. That was the longest streak in FBS coming into this game. The offensive staff told us during the week, we wish he would be more aggressive with throws. <laughs> be, be careful what you wish for. Yeah, maybe get some of those out of the way before the last game of the season. But the first interception comes here with a seven-point deficit. And now a chance for Georgia State to tack on to that. And that being said, if your defense can make a stop, you've got a quarterback that hasn't been sharp early, but now you need your defense to step up. Get a stop, get the ball back in the hands of your offense. Now, ironically for Quad Brown, the problem for him this year at times has been not knowing, they say, when to give up on a play. They have to give up on this drive, though, pending the flag. After the play, unsportsmanlike conduct, number 36 in the defense. Wow. This is the first unsportsmanlike conduct, 15 yard penalty, automatic first down. Kyle Bailey with the infraction, the linebacker, not only keeps the drive alive, but sends the blue and white marching toward midfield. Wow, what a huge play it is. 
I mean, you're getting ready to get the ball back to your offense with a chance to try and chip away, tie the football game. And afterwards, after the play's over, 15-yard penalty, Georgia State keeps the football. That's a big mistake by Kyle Bailey. Makes it first and 10 at their own 43. And this is an interesting game for anybody who's a senior, as Bailey is. Because Tyson Helton said, for seniors, I understand guys who want to come back with nobody's eligibility clock advancing this year. I understand guys who don't want to come back, who don't have prospects to play football at the next level and say, hey, coach, I want to start a family. I want to go get a job somewhere else and, and do something different. And they've also got a couple of guys who, he didn't confirm this, but it's been reported, entered themselves into the transfer portal too. Roger Cray, a defensive back. Tyler Witt, one of the offensive linemen. I think there was some massaging of the English language there from Coach Elton as well, because coaches, I think, bluntly would tell you there's some guys who they'd say, it didn't work out as well as I'd hoped, and I'd, it'd be better off if they don't come back for another year. And that's going to be the phenomenon, because it's going to happen across the country, not just these two schools, but a number of schools. And the transfer portals created some stuff in this season, eligibility. And I actually like what Coach Sean Elliott said the most, <laughs> describe it the best, said when the season's over, there's fixing to be some poaching going on. <laughs> Meaning players are going to be all over the place. Although that's not an exclusively new phenomenon to college sports either, because that has been the domain of Power Five versus Group of Five schools for some time. Five minutes before the half, Brown loads up, catapults downfield, incomplete. And let's go down to Dawn. Talking about the transfer portal, I thought head coach Tyson Helton had an interesting, different perspective on it, though. He said it's a two-way street, so he chooses to embrace the portal. He might end up losing some key players that were under-recruited and then showed out, but he did point out, guys, he could pick up a former four-star from a big-time program. He looks at it like maybe NFL free agency almost. It could help him as well. I like that attitude. Well, it's like... Monty Python said, right? You've always got to look on the bright side of life and see where it can benefit you. Brown tucks it, runs, and gets inside the 40 to set up third and short. You know what we say in football terms? Same things that make you laugh can make you cry. And I think that's what's going to happen there. You're going to lose some, but you're going to gain some. And right when you think you've gained a bunch, somebody's going to come take some of yours. Third one, obviously two down territory here. I'd like to see him pick it up, run the football, and finish this first half strong. If you're Georgia State, you're saying, worst case scenario, we're going into the locker room up by seven. Best case scenario, we'll be up by 14, maybe 15. But I'm not giving Western Kentucky an opportunity to put any more points on the board this half. Close it out, they've had a solid first half. Play hard between the whistles. Realize where you're on the football field and execute your offense. Tenth play of this drive comes from the Western Kentucky 33. Brown back to throw. Pink knees his guy down oh, the sideline. And he comes up with the catch. Remarkable from Pinkney to haul it in. He mossed him. <laughs> he mossed him. What a throw. And we talk about the relationship that they have using your six foot four inch wide receiver the 50 50 ball no when you're throwing it to sam pinkney it's more like 70 30 advantage georgia state going right over the top of dom bradshaw the ensuing handoff is to coats between the hashes for a couple and that's a good matchup there six four pinkney versus six foot even dom bradshaw who's broken up 10 passes this year, and he didn't stand a chance. Well, that's going to be a tough assignment because of how much man-to-man -man coverage they play. And this offense, the passing game, it starts with Pinckney and then everybody else, and that was a great play. Oh, 
Quad Brown and the Panthers dwindling the clock inside of three minutes. Greg navigating east-west, takes it to the five-yard line. Well, this is a spot here where you've got a lot of options. You could go to Carter, the tight end. What's imp been impressive, too, though, has been neither running back, Coates nor Greg, has seemed to go down quite easily on first contact today. Brown on the rollout, a fast ball to the back of the end zone. Touchdown, Georgia State. What a throw to Jamari Thrash. Playing in his home state of Alabama, Cornelius Brown throws a strike. Not an easy throw at all. Rolling to his left, but look at the placement of the ball and a good job of Securing the catch by Thrash. So another sustained drive. This the third of the afternoon from Georgia State, a team that averages 33 a game, already at 21 near the midway point. Like you're in the backyard in the middle of summertime. A slip and slide touchdown catch from Jamari Thrash. A crisp and cool afternoon here in the city of Mobile, Alabama. Georgia State after another touchdown up 21-7 over Western Kentucky. With Jay Walker and Don Davenport, I'm Mike Cousins. Glad to have you along with us on a great day for college football. And a good crowd on hand here as well to watch these two squads. Short kick taken from the 15-yard line. Chance for a big return. Out to the 30, the 40, and now midfield. And unimpeded until the end of that run. A solid return from Beanie Bishop. Two minutes before the half, another chance for the Hilltoppers to put something on the board. Capital One halftime report, Fields and Lawrence part two. Who has the advantage there? Plus, how does Notre Dame pull off the upset against Alabama? Huge underdog there in the ACC gets to keep one of their star players who's deciding to come back next year. Jesse Palmer in studio. Joey Galloway long distance coming up with the Cap 1 Halftime Report. All right, two minutes to go, Matt, here in Mobile before the end of the half. And Western Kentucky trying to cut into this Georgia State advantage after a big return on the kickoff. Pigram going for it. Oh, on the first throw, and that ball into the end zone is picked off. He hadn't thrown an interception the entire season, and that's his second in the first half. Well, Coach said he wanted him to take some chances. And, and you know what? In his defense, these aren't bad balls. These are just great efforts by the defensive backs. If you're a wide receiver, you can't let you can't lose that battle to John Trey Hunter there. You, you've got to go up, make a play. Either I'm catching the ball or nobody's catching the ball. Not able to do it. And that's a good play by Hunter. The interception in the end zone. We saw Antavius Lane with the pick before. And this time Hunter, the linebacker. As Pigram taking these chances like Dave Matthews been. But turning it over. So plenty of time to move here for Quad Brown. Throws it away on first down. So far, the redshirt freshman, Jay, has proved to be the much better decision maker of the two quarterbacks. Yes, and that's what he's been able to do. And you, know, you got a little battle of Alabama. You know, realize both quarterbacks are from the state of Alabama. They're both playing in front of a home crowd here. But Quad Brown is playing like the leader of an offense that averages 32 points a game. You know, they're doing some things. He's distributing the football and allowing his playmakers to make plays. 
They set up some space to run for Terrence Dixon, and there's uh -oh. got to be a flag thrown here. There's there lots of punches ejection. being thrown. Terrence Dixon for Georgia State was just throwing some hands. Oh, they're there's fighting again, Mama. One flag, two flags, and there's going to be a lot to be sorted out here as Dixon made the catch and then sashayed into the Western Kentucky sideline, and that is where the brutality began. What are they trying to prove here? Well, you can't beat them, so we're going to win the fight off the field or something like that? They're also all wearing helmets and pads, so I never understand throwing a punch when somebody's hey, got protective hey, gear. Easy, easy. That's, that's football etiquette. Now, now <laughs> come on now. Now you're trying to insult our intelligence as football players, but... Uh, well, this is this is ugly. There should be some ejections off of that. Just nonsensical extracurriculars. But it's been building up, though. Remember yeah. we said it right from the beginning. We said pregame. It came out during the game. It was a lot of chirping back and forth and yapping, and then ongoing and ongoing. What do we had? Three personal fouls called on Sportsmanlike. At least. And now, just had three of them just now. Not the display of football you want to have in your bowl game. Tyson Helton, Sean Elliott. I think the hardest part here from an official's perspective is trying to sort out as you have dozens of players converging who did what and what level does it rise to, whether it's an ejection or a 15-yard penalty? The, you have to single somebody out. When you throw that flag, you don't just throw it because, you know, there's a melee. You, you're supposed to see a number, remember that number, and throw it. I give credit to the guys in stripes. When it comes to ejections and calling those penalties and fights, they normally, they normally get it right. You ever get mixed up in one of those? No. <laughs> Play quarterback, man. <laughs> Don't let him get hurt. After the play, unsportsmanlike conduct, number 44, Western Kentucky's bench. That player is disqualified, ejected from the game. The result is a 15-yard penalty with an automatic first down. Well, it started off quite innocently. Just some blockers out in front. For Dixon, and then he ends up along the bench. So the block all the way in to the sideline, and that's what got Western Kentucky fired up. And you see 44 is right in the middle of it all. And, oh, he put in hand on an official. He was telling the official to get off me. He's got his helmet in his hand still, but he told the official, get off me with a little swipe. Automatic. So the defensive lineman David Nduque is disqualified for the remainder of the afternoon. It's a tough way to have your season come to an end. Little surprise that they just found that one penalty there. Now, let's hope the message has gotten through to the players and, and just play football. I suppose that resolution is looking at the problem more through a telescope than a microscope. <laughs> if you're under the microscope, you got probably a few more ejections you could hand out if you yep. wanted to. So after all that, first and 10 from their own 41, a minute 40 and three timeouts. And if Georgia State can expand on this lead before the half, take advantage of the penalty. It would be really hard to get motivated if you're Western Kentucky in the second half. Destin Coates, nowhere to roam. Trudging through the middle, a minute 25 and counting. Brown back and ready to throw from the jump. And a hard hit leads to an incompletion. A devastating blow by Antoine Kincaid. They call him their version of Ed Reed in the secondary. And he came through in a major way. Yeah, great instincts. Fantastic break on the ball. And this is how you play safety. Ball's in the air. Run through him, grab him around the waist. Put a hard hit. 
Knock the football loose. Dixon took in the, taking the hit, the former walk-on, and got put on scholarship last year. He is right back to it. Third and nine, four Hilltoppers on the rush. The dump down to the outside is enough for the first down. Enjoyed seeing the way they used Jemias Williams, the speediest out of the backfield. He gains 11. We talked about Williams, former defensive back, now playing running back. But it's been very interesting watching Western Kentucky try to identify where number 15 Sam Pinckney is. And now you see they do a bunch formation. They put Pinckney in the slot. And Pinckney's going long. Pass interference, isn't it? No flags good, down. Good job by Devin Key. Got away with it, but they tried to sneak Pinckney into a bunch formation and get him isolated one-on-one -on -one versus safety compared to competing against cornerbacks. And just not able to connect. Now, now watch the attention Pinckney gets. Now they move him opposite side, in man on the line of scrimmage. That's Pinckney right there. Brown looking short. Williams was there, incomplete, and another third down. Did you see the safety get him over the top and the linebacker underneath? So if you're another wide receiver, a secondary receiver for Georgia State, there's some opportunities to have some big plays because of the two defenders trying to double team on Sam Pinckney. A sophomore wide receiver. Tricky to guard for anyone. A matchup problem for Clayton White, the defensive coordinator. Flags are down as Brown just got into his drop back. Ball start. Number 17 in the offense. Five yard penalty. Remains third down. The only looking ahead these coaches are doing right now is to halftime and what they're going to say. But after this game is over, coaches told us we are both taking some time off. Tyson Helton said, I'm going a little hunting, a little fishing. Sean Elliott said, see you guys on January 11th back in the office. Big what? run on the handoff, what? a burst no, they needed. No, call timeout. If you're going to go for it, either call timeout or spike it. I think you call timeout after getting the big run. And we've seen Destin Coach holding on to the football today. Hard running, nice acceleration. Good job by this offense, Georgia State. And I like that you should call the timeout now. Now you're, you're in attack mode again. When it was third and long, okay, we'll take our chances. But once you cross the 40-35, Attack mode, trying to see if you can set up something for Noel Rees, your field goal kicker, to increase the lead. Our first of the new year is six games, a top 10 matchup. It's Florida and Oklahoma. Kyle Trask of Florida, their quarterback, a Heisman finalist, 43 touchdowns, five interceptions, and Oklahoma on the outside of the CFP looking in for the first time in three years. Can Florida's defense do enough to contain Oklahoma? That game... Wednesday, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ESPN in the app. Love Kyla Trask. However, however, Spencer Rattler, quarterback for Oklahoma, he's coming on. He's starting to play some really good football in his freshman campaign, becoming a weapon. Jay, it's a 14-point difference right now, a chance for more. What's been the biggest gap between these two so far? The ability to convert on third down and the big play like that. Brown tucks it in down the sideline for his tight end, Roger Carter. An ever-reliable target, but he's slow to get up after a gain of 26. I mean, the location of this throw by Brown is perfect. Back shoulder, nobody's going to intercept that pass. Only person's going to catch it that have a chance would be Carter. And a good job of coming up with the reception. 
Carter committed to FAU coming out of high school, but when Lane Kiffin took over, the offer was no longer there. So the beneficiary was Sean Elliott and this Georgia State squad. Carter off the field on this snap. The 22 seconds and two timeouts left for Georgia State. Yeah, that much. You can attack the defense, whatever they give you now. Since you've got your timeouts, if something says you should run the football, you can run the football. And they do. Timeout. Get the timeout. We still got one. Now, this is where I simplify the offense. I'm down here. I'm going to throw the ball at least one time to Sam Pinckney in the end zone. See if he can jump over somebody. Isolate him with the formation schematically. And see if your big-time receiver can make a, another touchdown grab for you. Well, everything that we talked about regarding the Western Kentucky defense was how strong the defensive line was and their ability to get into the backfield. How has that been neutralized today? The running game. I mean, I think that was a surprise that Georgia State running game, Dustin Coates. Dustin Coates has come in and been an impact player and playing so much man-to-man -man coverage. I think once Pinckney established himself as a premier player in this game, it really opened up the running game, and Coates has been the beneficiary of it. And through the air, Quad Brown already... 167 yards against a defense that allows only 170 passing yards a game, a top 10 number in FBS. They're spread out on second and goal. Plenty of time for Brown rolling and throwing into the stands. <laughs> Wait a minute. Coach used to tell me, if you feel some pressure, throw it away, throw it in the bleachers. I mean, I was like a figure of speech. But Quad Brown literally just threw that ball in the bleachers, in the stands. But the fan had to throw the ball back on the field. <laughs> the metallic clang of that ball hitting the bleachers radiated throughout the entire stadium. <laughs> well, you said the third down conversions have been huge. When you convert 75% of the time, that'll easily vault you in front, as they are right now up 21-7 and trying to add some more. Brown throws. That's end zone. Touchdown. <laughs> Cornelius McCoy with the Panthers score. What did we say earlier? If you give him the option to throw it, he's going to throw the backside slant off play action, covered or not. Look, quick run. Watch him set up quick. He's locked and loaded. That ball's coming out. Another strike from Cornelius Brown. Most expedient scoring drive of the day ends with a blocked extra point try and a pile of players at the nine yard line. So the gap remains 20 for Western Kentucky. Good job of showing some athleticism by D'Angelo Malone. All conference selection at defensive end. Yeah, they're really high on him. Well, that was Zion Williamson esque <laughs> with the full palm on the ball, but 25 sacks for him. The Western Kentucky FBS record needs just. One tackle for loss coming into the game to set that school record as well. 6'4", 230. Now he can come back, but like Tyson Hilton said, with guys who have that eligibility and some might say, I want to move on, that's a guy you certainly understand if he chose to pursue a professional career. Hayes with a squib up the middle. It's just waning moments left on the clock here in the first half. Flag comes 
from the spot of the kick with two seconds left. Holding number 35 of the return team. 10 yard penalty from the end of the run. First down. One big regret from this first half for Western Kentucky certainly can be, not that that penalty is going to be a game changer, but the amount of yardage given away on penalties. And I think the one that was really a turning point was 14-7 contest, and they make the stop on third down. You're going to get the football back, and you get called for unsportsmanlike after the play was over, and Georgia State made them pay for it. Georgia State's lead is 20 at the half. We go to the studio now, our Capital One Halftime Report with Jesse, Joey, and Matt. Mike, thank you. Welcome into the Capital One Report. Jesse Palmer, Joey Gallup. Time report, North Carolina star running back Devontae Williams is opting out of the Orange Bowl. He will enter the 2021 NFL Draft. He said Saturday, 1,100 yards and 157 carries with 19 touchdowns. Welcome back to the Lending Tree Bowl as part of Capital One Bowl Mania. Under the lights of the moon and both artificial here at Lat Peebles Stadium, Georgia State up 27-7 over Western Kentucky as we get ready for the start of the third quarter. So glad you're here with us as you relax at home or wherever you may be. Don Davenport down on the field. Jay Walker, Mike Cousins. Quad Brown, pretty solid first half for the redshirt freshman playing in its home state. Yeah, ball distribution, getting the ball to Pinkney, hit big play wide receiver early, then throwing a strike here, rolling to his left ball on the money to thrash, and he really was a difference maker there. And wasn't done. Cap off the half with another touchdown to really extend the lead there. Impressive performance by Cornelius Brown. It was 7-7 after one quarter. And things started really to tumble downhill for Western Kentucky in the second quarter. They ran, as they get ready to take the ball here, only eight plays in the second quarter compared to 34 for Georgia State. And, and the recipe to beat Georgia State was to keep their offense off the sideline. They wanted to win time of possession and ball control. Outside of that one drive they had to take the early 7-0 lead, it's been all Panthers. Bevy of short kicks so far here this afternoon and advantageous starting field position for Western Kentucky after the half. Let's get the latest from Dawn. Hey guys, uncharacteristic half for Western Kentucky quarterback Tyrell Pigram. He threw his first two picks of the season in that half. I asked head coach Tyson Helton what he had to say to him at the half. He said, I didn't have to say anything to him. I felt like he was in the right spot. His eyes were in the right spot. It was just good coverage from that standpoint. He felt like he would be okay this half. Now on the other side of the ball, head coach Sean Elliott pointed out his defense's ability to keep Pigram in the pocket. That's why they were able to force him into some bad decisions. They got to continue that this half. Don, all of those things make really good sense because Pickram comes in 328 rushing yards. He's their second leading rusher. And as you mentioned, the two interceptions, 264 pass attempts coming into this game without an interception, the longest active streak at the FBS level. That streak is now over. And I, I agree with Coach. What Coach told Don, effort. He, no, they weren't necessarily bad reads. It was just more hustle from the defensive back making better plays. The wide receivers didn't help him out. He's going to need some help from his receiving core. That throw was right to the sticks and spotted just one yard shy on the completion from Pigram. And that's Dakota Thomas, who we've seen have a spark. And watch the young freshman just elevate, climb the ladder, catch it at his highest point. That's helping out your quarterback. Dakota Thomas, the freshman from Snellville, Georgia, hadn't made a catch prior to their final game of the season against Charlotte. And that game was a journey in and of itself just to get there. Now has three catches today and eight on the season. They're without Xavier Lane, who is their second leading receiver this year. He hasn't seen action in over a month. That Charlotte game, though, that concluded their season, Western Kentucky has played 11 games. That's a very small group of FBS teams this year. 
And through their first 10 games, they hadn't had a game canceled or rescheduled until they got to that Charlotte game, which was postponed, canceled, and then rescheduled. As they got everything back on track. And Charlotte, one of the teams this year that unfortunately saw plenty of schedule alterations due to COVID-19 complications. Pigram with a fastball. And Josh Simon, the tight end, hangs on to that despite a fervent effort, gains 10 and a first down. And off to a good start here in the second half. We're seeing Pigram throw the ball with intention and purpose. Good job. And if you're Western Kentucky, you say, if we can just put some points on the board first in the second half, put a little bit of pressure for Georgia State offense to continue to score points in bunches. Big room with a clean pocket, plenty of time to throw, connects with Simon once again. He's on the run, inside the 10, slipping tackles all the way down to the five yard line. You have to like Joshua Simon and what he brings to the table. 6'5", 240 pound sophomore, but once he gets open, watch him change directions and run like a wide receiver. And stride, difficult to bring bound, good route runner. This kid can play. Pigram with Gage Walker in the backfield. Just three carries for 13 yards for the running back in the first half. <laughs> oh no, shovel pass didn't work. <laughs> Not a beautiful finish to that on first and goal. And there was some contact after the play was over in the area of the tackle. We saw plenty of 15-yard penalties in the first half. They tried to get Simon running down the line, and great job by Trajan Stevens McQueen. Not being fooled by, put a pretty good thump on Simon. Pigram on second and goal. The fade to the back of the end zone is incomplete. Broken up nicely by Jalen Jones. And we've got They're a flag. Fighting again, Mama. We got a flag <laughs> at the goal line. Mama, tell them start fighting, please. Play football. We want to see this. You got the match up there. The six four foot six foot four inch Craig Burt. Threw it up for grabs a little bit. Give him a little bit more air so he can catch it at his highest point. Number 90, the well, defense. Hill will be enforced half the distance to the goal. Automatic first down. That's number 90's first unsportsmanlike conduct. Hardrick Willis, the school sack leader, is coming off the field. Getting some words of perhaps encouragement from Sean Elliott. How does it work if you're if you got to do conditioning after you pick up a 15-yard <laughs> penalty, but it's the end of the season, how does that carry over? Well, coach is going to find you. <laughs> coach will find you. Or you better make sure you win the game, and he may forget. But that's been the one thing that's been a scar on this game. And off to Walker, and he is in clean to the end zone. Two touchdowns today for Western Kentucky. Two short runs, one for Pigram, this one for Walker. And the Hilltoppers, after a scoreless second quarter, are back on the board. And, you know, the key is coaches earn their paychecks to me beginning of the game and at halftime. Halftime adjustment. Give credit to Tyson Helton. Whatever he said in the locker room to this offense, they came out and had an impressive drive to start the second half. They were much more efficient than in that second quarter where they converted just one first down and snapped the ball eight times. Walker, the former defensive back, turn running back, turns that into six, and they're down by 13. This is Capital One Bowl Mania. Back here in Mobile, our producer today, Russ Winham, our director, Tim Sutton, Don Davenport on the sidelines with Jay Walker. I'm Mike Cousins. Glad to have you with us. Gage Walker taking it in for the second Western Kentucky touchdown of the day. And now they kick away as the sun begins to depart here today in Mobile. And the temperatures begin to dwindle as well. 
They'll be starting field position inside the 20 yard line for Georgia State. And Don Gage Walker has had quite a journey in his time on the Hilltop. Yeah, came in as a DB, but offensive coordinator Brian Ellis had recruited him back in high school. He was a wing tee running back tailback in high school, so he knew how talented he was with the ball in his hands. So they approached Gage about the switch from DB to running back the spring prior to last season. And guys, Walker was a, a little hesitant at first. A couple of carries, a long touchdown run in week one of last year. He was all in. He's been all in ever since. Mike and Jay coaches said that he has worked his his tail off ever since they made the move. He never gets tired. We're seeing it. Yeah, Don, it's impressive to be able to pick up an entirely new skill set and basically relearn everything that you know, Jay, about what you've been doing in the sport. Hey, his last name is Walker, right? I mean, come on, Walker. We, we do everything, man. Yeah, <laughs> we do everything. Why doubt yourself? And they're going to get stronger at running back next year. They're going to bring in Adam Cofield. Look at this, boy. See, that, uh, that's one. Well, we know the game is getting a little bit chippy and out of control a little bit. Blow the whistle early. Don't give them an opportunity for extra forward progress. I, and the, the football player in me is, you love it, but the way this game is going, I still think we're going to see a couple more penalties, and it's going to be costly to one of these teams. But I think the referees can help out and try to control that emotion a little bit. Channel a little bit of Bay Area music and too short. <laughs> what you know about the Yay area? Blow the whistle. Blow the whistle. <laughs> <laughs> if you know, you know. If you don't, now you know. You got it on your phone. Look it up. <laughs> Testing Coates over 100 yards on the ground. 18 carries for 103. For what has been at times a two headed and others more of a Hydra three headed attack when you throw in Jamias Williams as well. And something I've noticed that defensive coordinator Clayton White is doing for Western Kentucky. He's taking his two defensive linemen, Ricky Barber and Jeremy Darvin, and he's covering up. He's leaving the center alone and they're covering up the A gaps. So they're going with their techniques to try and stop the run. But they were getting sliced up pretty good. And there it is, see? They like the adjustment. And they get the stop after allowing eight straight third down conversions. Reason to celebrate as they force the punt team onto the field. They did a great job how they slanted Jeremy Darvin in there. And this was a move made for run defense. Kind of sacrificing some of the pass rush there. And a good job by the senior from Nashville, Tennessee with the tackle for loss. Michael Hayes on to punt for just a second time. Gets it away. Hit him. That wobbler's loose. Georgia State sideline celebrating. And yep. they've got it. Their communication error with the return man and the up man. John Trey Hunter comes up with that loose ball, and so it just ends up being a huge gain of field position for Georgia State. And the defense that moments ago was celebrating now has to come back and go back to work. Right back on the field. That's disheartening. Takes a lot of emotion to get that three and out. Special teams lets him down. Brown with the handoff that thunders off to the left side for Tucker Gregg. And this is the end of that punt. So Gregg got six on the carry. Quad Brown, back to throw and brought down. He was looking to go to Pinkney, surprised he didn't let it go, but I've seen Western Kentucky take a linebacker, and every time you think it's one-on-one -on -one with Pinkney on the outside, they're buzzing either a safety or a linebacker underneath that route. They've even sent defensive linemen underneath to try and confuse the read of Quad Brown, not making it an easy throw.
Brown floats it and too long for Cornelius McCoy. So it's fourth down. Ball is at the 28 yard line. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go for a field goal here. Field goal try because let's not forget we saw D'Angelo Malone block an extra point. Yes. Pretty easily. Be careful. But the field goal team does come on. Noel Ruiz. His longest made field goal this year is 46. And this try is from 45. Timeout, Georgia State. Timeout, Georgia State. This is the first timeout they have. One lineman who was tardy to the party. So the field goal try for Ruiz, imminent from 45. Well, we're less than two hours away from one of the most highly anticipated postseason games this college football season, Liberty Coastal Carolina. Last 14 times they've played, split them 7-7. Liberty plus nine in the scoring column. And Coastal Carolina, Sun Belt champions, winners of 12 straight. Jamie Chadwell's hot as a coach, doing a good job for the Chompton Clears, but don't sleep on Hugh Freeze and the job he's done at Liberty University. With Malik Willis at quarterback, the former Auburn signal caller, it's been a huge boost to their offense. Timeout from Georgia State. After they had an offensive lineman late getting on the field, now they're set for the 45-yard try from Noel Ruiz. And that kick from Ruiz is good. Clutch. The FCS All-American last year at North Carolina A&T makes it a 30 to 14 game. And that's what's unique about this college football season. Cover Ruiz when he was down there in Greensboro for the Aggies. Kicked the game winner versus Elon, which was a huge victory for Sam Washington and that squad. And called on here in a bowl game. An opportunity to play and has just enough to get it over the crossbar. Well, look at that, get a little pump. And that's taking advantage of the opportunity. Special teams came up with the fumble recovery. Offense put points on the board and congratulations, Mr. Ruiz. And a nice kick and been a pretty good college career. Imagine that, FCS All-American. All you want to do is show that you can kick on the main level, on the main stage. And He's had a pretty good year kicking the football this season. Make a nice jump up and have the opportunity to have your team finish with six wins on the year. I do have to say, when Sean Elliott celebrating that field goal, you look a lot more fierce when you have a Panther on the front of your mask. <laughs> that fist pump looked like it could hurt. And Coastal Carolina making its case to say, hey, look, we know we're not a Power 5 team as we look at the Cure Bowl coming up 7.30 after our game. They're soon to be president of the university wrote an open letter to the college football playoff committee to say, we deserve that opportunity. And talking to both coaches in this game too, they said, we need that shot. And I think particularly a conference like the Sun Belt and you know, Conference USA, they wanna know what has to be done to just have an opportunity. And so over the years, you look at where the top group of five team has finished in the college football playoff final rankings. Go back to Western Michigan, rowing the boat, the number 15 UCF in back-to-back -back years, 12 and eight. Memphis at number 17, and then Cincinnati is a team that certainly has a grievance this year with how well they played, finishing perfect 9-0. and Coastal Carolina, 11-0. and And even the teams here, Georgia State, five and four, Western Kentucky, five and six. The coaches really didn't mix their words in talking about that they're disappointed with the way that the system works because Sean Elliott said, we have no shot at the college football playoff. We're the only teams in the NCAA that have no shot at playing for a national championship. That's a very sad thing to know. Tyson Helton said it needs to change. This is the year to do it. We got to go to eight because if you win your league title, you should be able to play in it. And I think that's a fair point. 
And let's not forget about San Jose State. I mean, they're undefeated right. out there on the West Coast and playing for not much. But it all goes back to here's where I'm going to show my age and how much of a college football fan I've been my whole life. Can you think of the last non-Power 5 or Notre Dame team to win the national championship? I can't think of what I had for lunch. So <laughs> why don't you fill us? <laughs> Pigram, deep drop on first down, gets absolutely clobbered as he rainbows this ball downfield, and it falls incomplete. Now the answer to your trivia question. The answer is BYU, 1984. I remember that, and there was a controversy. Should they get the championship, or should the University of Washington get it? I know that because my cousin played for the University of Washington at the time, and I was hoping they got the shot. But it was BYU. And I want to say the quarterback was Robbie Bosco. You see Pigram take a shot there, but kind of thinks that that's a shame since 1984. Nobody outside of Power Five or Notre Dame has had a chance at that. And there's a difficulty there for coaches, too, because you can think. Look up. And you can say at the beginning of the season, we want to play for a <laughs> national championship. But the reality is that they're not. These teams might feel like they're in a championship game right now with how much jawing and jousting there's been back and forth. Um, and, and you're starting to let people get away with, with late hits and offensive linemen doing a little extra takedown. And this is at the end of the play. You know, they got the two on one. It's a double team swinging. I mean, you know. It's, a, it's like, well, are the officials scared to throw the flag now? Because nobody's backing down, and that's hard to Willis. Had he gotten penalized, he'd have been ejected. Right. Because he got one already, so he's fortunate. Good job by the coach of pulling him from the football game. They've also got to convert here. Need 10 for the first down, and Pigram is brought down. That's that guy you're not going to outrun, Jordan Strong. The NFL talent that wants to be a great player and making an impact in this game. I mean, take a look at Strong, number seven. And we know Pigram can scoop. He can run, but Strong stretches out, uses that frame, comes up with a sack. Flag was dropped at the 44-yard line. Well, here's the answer. After the play, unsportsmanlike conduct, number seven of the defense. 15-yard penalty on that first down. That's number seven's first unsportsmanlike conduct. I mean, this is one that, it's getting out of control. Well, the Lending Tree Bowl is home to the highest scoring bowl game in bowl game history. Uh, this may be the <laughs> most unsportsmanlike conduct uh, penalties in bowl uh, game history. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He went over there, and that was more of a taunting foul, taunting the bench. But we knew the officials had to make an example out of somebody. Gage Walker with a burst. That'll get the sideline going, Don. The chippiness was addressed by both coaches at the half, guys. Sean Elliott told me that he likes the fact that his team was creating energy, but he said, you got to be smart about it. He said, my guys won't back down. I'm proud of that, but he pointed out they have to stay disciplined. I'm not sure that that's what they're doing so far this half, guys. Come on, Doug. You know they're not. You see these fights like we do. You're up close and personal with it. <laughs> so both sidelines... Juiced up. That's a beautiful throw. But out of bounds as Pigram lofted it up. Trying to connect with the 6'4", Craig Burt. And Burt did a good job of trying to get that foot down. Good job by the defensive back. You can push him out of bounds to not make the catch. And once he realized that he was going to make the catch, you can push. That's a lot of contact prior to that ball getting there, though and just not able to get the foot down in bounds. Second and 10, Pigram with the drop. 
clean pocket. He deposits it underneath the defense. Oh, nice cut. Walker nice cut. slips, and he gets ankle tackled after a pickup of 15. You know, Western Kentucky's had some good runners before. Bobby Rainey comes to mind, but this is a really good job of running the football after the catch. Watch him change directions. One cut, shake him, break to the outside. Gage Walker putting it on display, showing he's got a little mm with him. How do you spell that? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Onomatopoeia at its finest. Walker in the backfield. Four receivers for Pigram. He darts it right into the chest of Dayton Wade, returning and playing his first game since before Halloween. Wade is a speedster and able to get to the center of that defensive secondary in a hurry. And watch Pigram make up his mind. Pigram makes up his mind, throws a rope. Hilltopper showing some fight. You could hear that ball hit the shoulder pads yeah. from up here. And off for Walker, who's tumbled to the turf at the two. Give it to him again. Forward progress, just keep going. Watch number 48. 48's in the game. They line him up as a fullback. Steven Wachowski. Follow him, and you'll probably find the football. In this set earlier, when he went in motion, Pigram ran for a touchdown. And this time, the defense was waiting for quarterback run. So how spicy are they feeling here on fourth down? Look, you're down by 16. That's two, that's two touchdowns and two two-point conversions. You go for it. And we've got a timeout for an injured Georgia State Panther. It's Keon Carter, the senior safety. And this is one where you pretty much got laid on the line, lost a yard on that last one, last play. And one thing we've seen about Pigram he, he can run, but doesn't necessarily like to run. Doesn't look like the most comfortable runner. He wants to distribute the ball, but I still think you want to get him on the edge and maybe slip Joshua Simon out into the flat, the six-foot, five-inch tight end who's had a pretty good football game. But here comes Wachowski. He goes in motion. Look for him to run that way. Here he comes. Pigram keeps it. He throws back in the end zone for Simon, and it's too long. And it's a turnover on downs. He had him. That was what we said. Slip Simon out. Quavy and White, the cornerback for Georgia State. Arriving in the back of the end zone with the offense set to receive the ball. Fourth and goal. Off the fingertips of the 6'5", Simon, and into the ether. Missed opportunity for Western Kentucky on fourth and goal. They've got the matchup they want. Steven Wachowski has an opportunity to get open. And tell me, is this open or not, Mike? He's in the flag, getting the ball. He's wide That's open. That's a touchdown. You have to execute a little bit better. Get rid of that ball by design. They had the matchup they want, but Pigram just not able to find the open receiver. So the turnover on downs, on first down, a handoff to Destin Coates. And he got them at least a little bit of breathing room here so that they're not operating from their own end zone. And it's not to say that Western Kentucky, Jay, has not had their chances, especially in this quarter, after in the second quarter, they snapped the ball just eight times. Yeah, for them to be still within striking distance, considering the first half, which they were penalized for 107 yards, only had a touchdown, one drive, didn't control time of possession. Flag is down. 
Brown rainbows it down the sideline. And that ball is caught at the 42. Cornelius McCoy, a gain of 30. Take advantage of the free play. All sides, number nine of the defense. That pillow will be declined. First down. You know, and that only works like maybe 15% of the time. But we've seen McCoy show the ability to get behind defensive backs, take a chance, and got the feet in bounds. Helmet versus helmet here today. The chrome from Western Kentucky, the underlined Panthers with the red number. Who's who's got the edge for you in this? I, I like the bling. <laughs> you know, so I'm a bling guy. I, I've always thought that those Western Kentucky helmets, they're shiny. They're nice. Especially now as the, the sun is down, the moon is visible, the lights are on. A little bit chillier than you might have expected, huh? Absolutely. It's cold. I thought it, thought it was going to be golf weather down here. We're going to go hit up the Robert Trent Jones Trail, but not when it's 40 degrees. There were some folks over to the left of us in the press box earlier who had winter hats on. <laughs> It only makes me laugh because I left about seven or eight inches of snow back at home in Ohio. Quad Brown on the option, tumbles forward, and he's just short of the first down marker despite the slide at the end. The patience shown by Quad Brown on this option. You know, you're taught as a quarterback, you want to option off the end man in the line of scrimmage. If there's any hesitation at all, you just keep it as a quarterback. And he was able to freeze the outside linebacker there to pick up some yards with just one cut. Brown keeps it. And this time a lowered shoulder is enough to move the chains. I'm thinking up by 16 points. Georgia State saying, we're in no rush. Let's take this into the fourth quarter. Yep, and they've got enough time here before the end of the quarter to let things wind down. Fours are up. They're looking for energy. A sideline. Reminiscent of a mitochondria. 16 points the difference. Here in Mobile, Alabama in the 22nd Lending Tree Bowl. Clemson, Ohio State, Notre Dame. The college football playoff semifinals, New Year's Day on ESPN. Well, it happened so quickly, just 15 minutes to go here in the Lending Tree Bowl. And a penalty starts us off here in the fourth quarter. My cousins, along with the former NFL quarterback, Jay Walker, Don Davenport along the sidelines this evening here at Lad Peebles Stadium. All sides, number 97 of the defense. Five yard penalty, remains first down. That's on the nose tackle, Darius Ship. That, that's going to be tough because we know that at the end of the third quarter, Georgia State was trying to eat a little clock. Like they're going to go to the ground game. They've had success running the football. You give an offense that's trying to run the football, trying to run some clock, first and five, I and mean, that's the type of advantage they want. Well, as the moon appears close yet is light years away, this game might appear close, but since the end of the first quarter, it's been light years difference between these two. It was 7-7 at the end of the first quarter, a 20-point second quarter for Georgia State. That gap, that separation has held here into the fourth. Let me give a little credit to Western Kentucky. They, they were down by 20 at halftime. They did cut it to 16, so they're still hanging there. They, For all intents and purposes, they had the better third quarter. What can they do in the fourth quarter? Well, they've got to be able to stop the run because <laughs> that's what's going to be a heavy dose of what's coming their way. And the change that they made that they had some success with was going to a bare front defensive line. 
three defensive tackles they got away from it. Now they're going to a traditional stance, and you saw Georgia State hit them with a nice run just now. See, the key is you got to watch when they when they break the huddle, look and see how many defensive linemen interior over the center. See that right there? That's not that bare front. So they're having success running against that front. And when the offensive coordinator or the quarterback sees that change happen, what does the counter move need to be? When they've got it, well, when they don't go to it, then you can attack the perimeter or their inside zone read is open to you. But that's why they do this offense when you see them looking to the sideline. They're trying to see their personnel who's out there and calling the play for success against it. They had success running. So you've got one linebacker, number eight, the guy. This is the hot guy that you're reading off of right there. In the run game, got to make sure somebody blocks him. Brown throws high to the sideline. A trio of defenders converge. Somebody said take it. <laughs> Cornelius McCoy kept it. And it's a first down. And, th and that's the luxury you have when you've got somebody like Brown that can deliver the ball accurately and with nice velocity. And this is a big time throw. They're trying to buzz underneath the route. Not able to get there and a good job by McCoy. He's had a pretty good football game. Eleventh play of this time killing drive. Jamias to Williams. Thunders through the middle and picks up eight on the run. Yeah, both teams with guys getting carries who started out their careers as defensive backs. Gage Walker for Western Kentucky and Jemias Williams, transfer from South Carolina, who got eligible earlier this year. The rushing today, 221 yards on 46 carries for Georgia State. Came in at 190 yards a game. Last year, they were 13th in the country in rushing at 242. And at this pace, they'll eclipse that number today. And Jay, what really this has been, has been a demolition of what Western Kentucky has prided itself on this year. Averaging only 336 yards a game allowed total. And this is just the early phase of the fourth quarter. And then the one that stood out was the 166 yards they averaged giving up coming into this game. And as you said, Georgia State's well over that now and going to add on to it. Total yardage at 453 yards for the Panthers. Brown oh. over the top and nearly had a touchdown for Roger Carter. He missed one there. They snuck Roger Carter in there wide open for what would have been an easy touchdown. A little fun pass, flip pass. Yeah, Carter's at 10 touchdowns for his career. One more to get the school tight end touchdown record. And this sits up a short opportunity for Noel Ruiz from 29. His last try he hit from 45. Plenty of leg on it, and it's good. He extends the advantage 33-14. Georgia State in the fourth. Let's look at today's clutch delivery brought to you by Chipotle. 7-7 seven, seven ball game, still up for grabs, and Sam Pinckney makes his presence felt with the touchdown that gave him the lead, and they've been ahead ever since. Quad Brown today, 226 yards through the air, three touchdowns, did get picked once. And right about where his average is, 227 yards a game on the year, through the year, which was good for second in the Sun Belt this season. You get the feeling that watching Quad Brown play quarterback, there is a very bright future for this squad in Atlanta. 
the ability to, to do everything. And, you know, I always say a quarterback position starts first and foremost with the ability to throw the football to open receivers. And we've seen Brown have the ability to do that. But as they say, the surprise has been his ability to run the football, an effective runner in college football. Tyrell Pigram, the grad transfer from Maryland, back onto the field. Here with his team down 33-14. Only negative yardage so far. And a return to the line of scrimmage was not in the card. Talking to Quad Browns high school coach Andrew Zhao, who's a former quarterback himself at Alabama. He said, this is a guy who's a player, and I think we've understood this from watching the game today, who's a power five quarterback. He's at a group of five school, but his recruitment started a little bit late. And so there were coaches around the country, especially around the Southeast, the powerhouse of college football in the US. And he said to coaches, look, this is a guy who can play for you at that level. But the way that recruiting works is, it's a never-ending cycle, and so once coaches and staffs feel like they've locked up their guys for one class, they move on to the next class and the next class and so on. And so that's really a huge victory for Georgia State. And especially a quarterback. You know, when you're a quarterback, if I'm a top-tier recruit and you want to sign me, then you're not signing another quarterback. You can take an extra wide receiver, but Quad Brown was special. I got a text from Pep Hamilton, one of my good friends, offensive coordinator in the NFL, and he said, he loved Quad Brown out of high school and was very well coached by Andrew Zhao. So give credit to Coach Zhao. He knew he was a special talent. And there were some people that knew. And he's making the most of his opportunity. Pigram's pass complete to the 30. Don? Guys, his tight end, Roger Carter, told me that Quad has a thirst for knowledge. He feels like he'll do anything he needs to get better. He wants to learn. He said he's a true competitor, is constantly trying to adjust. So future there is certainly bright. That's coming from one of his teammates. Did you ever play with anybody like that who just always wanted more in terms of responsibility or information or uh, responsibility on the field from the coaches? You get a bunch of them, and a lot of them is offensive linemen. Those yeah. that aren't athletically gifted, and they figure out a way to just outwork everybody. You know what? I think we need to make a change in the football nomenclature. We need to call that a skill position, too. <laughs> <laughs> The Lending Tree Bowl, brought to you by Lending Tree. Shop and compare loans, credit cards, insurance, and more. And Allstate, you've never been in better hands. Some former MVPs in this game, Byron Leftwich in what was the highest scoring game in bowl history. Ladanian Tomlinson, back with the Horn Frogs in 2000. And the answer to that question in this game well, we still got 9.48 to go, but Quad Brown, quarterback for Georgia State, has so far looked very sharp in getting them out to this 19-point lead. Yeah, the freshman from about four hours away up in Birmingham, Alabama, has come back to his home state and played a really good football game. We talked about him in the open. He's a difference maker and showed America here tonight what he's capable of, and he still has room to grow. I think he'll be the first one to tell you that, and the coaching staff will do that as well. But Quad Brown's somebody you're going to be hearing about in college football for a couple more years to come. In this game, historically speaking, the Lending Tree Bowl, we're in the 22nd version of it this year. It's the second time the game is being played in 2020. Louisiana took on Miami, Ohio back on January 26th. I guess that's the 2019 version. Isn't that always confusing to you when you have to go back through college football postseason history where it's the 20, you know, it'll be the 2020 national championship game, but it's in 2021? Yeah. <laughs> I was just going, popping through some Wikipedia pages earlier today, and you've always got to see, well, what, was it before New Year's or after New Year's to figure out exactly what year's championship it was? 
You, know, you got a little bit too much time on your hands sometimes. I have a Mike. lot too much time <laughs> on my hands. Big play by Western Kentucky. Stop here, you know, for all intents and purposes, we see that Georgia State's doing a good job, but this Western Kentucky defense only giving up six points here in the in the second half, trying to give their team a chance to get back into it. They nearly get there on the punt. Tinsley lets it go, and the ball sits down at the 32. 36 yards on the kick. 741, fourth quarter, Mobile, Alabama. Hey, what are you doing New Year's Day? Nothing good. We got plans for you. Watch this game, noon Eastern on ESPN, and the app, the Peach Bowl, starts a big college football Friday. It's Georgia, it's Cincinnati. A Bearcats team with a large chip on their shoulder. Number eight in the final college football playoff rankings. But we, talk, we told you about Coastal Carolina earlier, and we showed you the history of where group of five teams have finished in the final college football playoff rankings. And you've got Cincinnati that's got their palms up to the sky saying, what more can we do, committee? And they do what you ask. They win everything on their schedule. I mean, nine and zero. Oh. Ranked in the top eight. Look at the win streak there, and Ritter's been getting it done for him. You know, and I think, what if Cincinnati beats Georgia, right? Then what happens? You just go back a couple years ago, right, in the Peach Bowl, as UCF beat Auburn. And I think what the college football fan may be a little bit disturbed by is when they decided to, you know, go to a playoff, I thought teams like Boise State that, you know, dominated in some bowl games thought they had a shot. You know, teams like the Cincinnati thought, okay, we're going to four teams, we've got a shot. And I think that's why they're, they're so upset because they're just not getting a shot. Well, even the commissioner of the American Athletic Conference, Mike Oresco, has perhaps, among group of five commissioners, been the most vocal in opposition to the way that the current system has favored Power Five teams. You saw Joshua Simon there taking a good hit. That's the dangers when you're a six-five target going across the middle of the field. That's a lot of target to hit. But it's, it's a work in progress, you know, going back to that. You know, hopefully, you would like to say there'll be a world where Cinderella does have a chance at a national championship. And I think the coaches that are voicing the fact that we're the only sport where you don't have a chance at a national championship. Pigram gallops his way to the 42-yard line, but not enough for a first down. And to continue that point, Brian Harson, the former head coach at Boise State, it came out that he was pushing for the school to leave the Mountain West because he didn't feel like there was enough push there from the conference to get them inclusion into the college football playoff. And then, lo and behold, after a prolonged search, he ends up in a Power Five conference <laughs> Power five. as the new head coach at Auburn. Man, and he's going to be playing for a national championship. Yes. And those. Those Tiger fans are going to demand that he get in <laughs> championship contention. Flags from every direction lined up on fourth and one. One of the offense, five yard penalty remains fourth down. See a jump right on the interior lineman, Jordan oh, Meredith. The Bowling Green native. Their high school, the home of the Purples. That's the name? It's their mascot, the the Bowling Purple. Green Purples. And I wonder, how did you find that out? You're doing high school mascots now, really? That's how you feel? We're, we got a... Uh, 33-14 game in the fourth quarter. What else you want? <laughs> the turnover on downs. The Georgia State defense swarms, smothers, and covers to force the turnover. Yeah, and, and you know what it is when you, when you look at this game. Think about it. Georgia State came in here with an offense that averaged 32.7. That's 33 points a game. They've got 33 right now. And the Western Kentucky offense came in averaging 18 points a game. 
and they're below that right now. And I think the Georgia State offense came to show up. And unfortunately for Western Kentucky, their offense is who the numbers say they are. A squad that averages about 18 points a game. And to put that in perspective, this Georgia State defense, it's not a juggernaut. They give up 33 points a game. Right. They had some very high scoring games on a couple of occasions this year where they scored over 50 points as they now turn the offense over to McKaylee Colasurdo, the freshman from South Carolina, the South Carolina Gatorade Player of the Year coming out of high school. It's only played in a couple of games this year, but no better time than the final one of the year when you're comfortably ahead oh, yeah. to see game. what's to see what's coming. Bowl game on ESPN. You got Mike Cousins talking about you. This is when you want to show you can run the offense and you know more and more you're starting to see teams realize you need two quarterbacks. He's taking a shot to the end zone. And <laughs> Collis Cerdo throws a touchdown. <laughs> Kadarius Thompson with a catch from 25 yards out. Just when you thought they might be done for the night, there's six more. I mean, that made his year right there. He missed all of fall camp, but started coming on strong and beat out some other people for that backup position, just a true freshman. And I like the style points. Did you see the spiral? That was a pretty spiral. Spiral was tight. Give him some style points and a great job by Kadarius Thompson helping out his young true freshman quarterback. Look at that smile. That, that's college football. That, that's why you play. That's why you do everything during the offseason and when you're lifting weights and you're running and jogging for an opportunity to come on this stage and perform like that. Uh-oh. Long snap. Cover it up. Take the L. Well, a beautiful spiral from Colasurdo. Let's rank them in descending order. Crustacean shells, staircases, and then number one, this throw from Michaeli Colasurdo. A look at the championship trophy for the Lending Tree Bowl this year here at Ladd Peebles Stadium, the historic venue in its 72nd year. And with the score 39-14 in favor of Georgia State, they can feel that trophy may be getting back on the plane to go home with them to Atlanta. Mike Cousins, along with the former NFL quarterback Jay Walker, Don Davenport on the sidelines tonight on a brisk evening here in Mobile. So new quarterback, same results for Georgia State. Yeah, and just put it in the sweet spot there. Delivered it outside shoulder, getting some help from Kadarius Thompson. The first pass in the postseason. Oh, yeah. You deserve it. Take a bow, young man. Take a bow. Colasurdo came in 0 for 2 in just a couple of games. <laughs> so his first career completion goes for a 25-yard touchdown. Quarterback controversy. Oh, don't no. start that. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to go back to a statement that you did make earlier about quarterbacks, which is sometimes it's better to have two, and nobody would ever deny themselves a wealth of riches. But there are – and that made me think of other teams that they go back and forth when they can't decide on a quarterback. So what exactly did you mean? Yeah, that's different. Now, I think in that case, if you're playing two quarterbacks, if you've got two, you've got none. Correct. That's what we said. But – if you've got an established starter and your backup is really good too, that you, there's not a drop off if an injury happens because kids are bigger, stronger, faster, so you get more injuries now than you've ever seen before. Or with the, in case of an injury, you want to have somebody that can run the offense and do good things. And I think that's why you know, they look good here. You got Brown, and now you got Carlos Soto comes in and does a good job throwing the football as well. There's also the aspect of the downside of the transfer portal that if a guy plays really well and a power five school comes calling, poaching, he could leave. <laughs> what the coach say? There's going to be some poaching going on. And that's ironic when you think about it, because, you know, I know we mentioned a little bit earlier that Western Kentucky is going to make a change in offensive coordinator. Yes. For this upcoming season. 
Make sure that you check out the ESPN app for the Capital One post game immediately following the game. We'll run through some of the best plays from this one and head down to the field as well for the presentation of the championship trophy and other major awards from this game. Pigram down the sideline, a lot of contact there. It's a tackle. I didn't miss that one. And surprisingly, no flag. But yes, this is the last game as the sole offensive coordinator for Brian Ellis of Western Kentucky. Within the last couple of weeks, Tyson Helton, the head coach, announced the hiring of Zach Kitley coming over from Houston Baptist. He'll be the new lead offensive coordinator as the plan stands now anyway. Ellis will be the co-offensive coordinator, but Kitley will be the chief play caller. And Jay, that's gonna be a spark for this offense as they get here what they have sorely needed throughout the game. But that Houston Baptist offense has had a prolific season, albeit a short one. Yeah, and their quarterback, led by their quarterback, Bailey Zapp, was lighting up everybody. FCS program that took on big time talent. Texas Tech took on some power five teams. I think he threw for 500 yards in one of those games. So the question it becomes, does Zap enter the transfer portal? Ooh, good fake. And Pigram down to the two. So you mentioned Texas Tech, well, Zach Kittley was an offensive assistant at Texas Tech with Patrick Mahomes, who he says he's excited for him to get the opportunity and talks about the investment that Kittley made in him on and off the field and wants to see what he does when he gets to be a coach for the Hilltoppers. His Houston Baptist team this year averaged 34 points a game, almost 550 yards, and says he wants their offense to get up into the range of 80, 85 plays a game. So that has the potential to be a massive change, as does another addition, too. Handoff is a touchdown for Western Kentucky. The addition, by the way, the running back Adam Cofield, who's coming in from North Dakota State after winning three FCS titles there. C.J. Jones scores the touchdown for Western Kentucky. Marvison nails the extra point. And a reminder to start your week 16 NFL Sunday, 10 Eastern on ESPN and the ESPN app. You got plenty of teams with a chance to clinch a playoff berth this week. Kansas City trying to get up to their first 14 win season. And with the race for the playoffs, well in the thick of things, you've got more opportunity than ever this year with the NFL's expanded playoff field. Yeah, well, only one team from each conference getting a bye week, so now more than ever that number one the number seed. number one becomes so much more crucial. Yes. Before, it was like, you know, you finished number two, didn't matter, you got a, a bye week anyway. Now, no, only the number ones. Do you like that more teams get in because there's a potential to say that the po the regular season loses value that way? No, uh, it's more football. You know, people want to play, play more football, give some more teams an opportunity because we've seen instances where teams get hot at the end of the year. You know, you get off to a slow start, you're not necessarily done. You can overcome. I mean, the New York Giants are in the playoff hunt because the NFC East is so bad. But I mean, <laughs> they, they got off, what, were they 1-5 or something at some point? 0-5 oh, right away and contending, so. And speaking of upside down, the Cleveland Browns are in the hunt for a playoff spot. They've got the longest drought in the NFL going back to 2002. It's been since then, Carl? Quite some time. Lad People Stadium, the site today, and opened all the way back in 1948. 
And the Lending Tree Bowl, among many other things, has been here since its inception in 1999. I think that line between 1951 and 2019, home of the Senior Bowl, which is where people will come down, all the best college football players in the country come out, NFL scouts come out. One name, one person that played in the Senior Bowl, I think I saw Joe Namath. And I saw a couple pictures of Bo Jackson. Let me think that Bo Jackson played down here on this field as well. All right, let's take a look at tonight's Capital One player of the game. And to no surprise, it's Quad Brown, the quarterback for Georgia State. And we said it in the open. He's the guy that makes this offense go. Showed some running ability. We saw him distribute the football, and that was a nice throw going to his left, across his body. And that's the quad route right there. Backside slam. I can't think of too many throw it better than he does. And an efficient day today. So Quad Brown, the Capital One player of the game. Gave way to McKaylee Colasurdo on the last drive. He threw a 25-yard touchdown. And they've got 217 to wipe off the clock here as they'll do it on the ground. So both coaches said right after this one's over, it is on to vacation mode. Sean Elliott said, coaches, players, see you January 11th when we get back. Start of the second week of January. And for Tyson Helton, a little fishing, a little hunting, a little downtime. And uh, that's something that I'm sure, Don, everybody could use after a long college football season. How about the rise of this Georgia State football program, too? Yes, they'll go on vacation, but you know Sean Elliott is all about work. He told us that he thought maybe it might be a marathon since he took over the job in 2017. It has really turned more into a sprint. I asked him the difference from 2017 when he got there to where they are now as a football program. He said, look, we used to get no emails, no tapes of recruits that were interested. He said, now we are overwhelmed with interest. It's been tremendous. They've transformed the vibe around their home stadium. Students stay on campus now. He told us, I am in a heck of a place at just the right time right now. There's a lot of energy around this Georgia State football program. Yeah, they have built it quickly. It's just their seventh season at the FBS level, 11th season of football overall. but. He's uh, already earned himself a contract extension, which is certainly a validation of the work that he's done. And not only do they have a great facility, but they've also got the players' apartments right across the street, which is super helpful too. So they played their first game at the Georgia Dome back in 2010. And then going to the FBS level, getting into the Sun Belt Conference, Playing in their first bowl in 2015, and this is their fourth bowl game in just an 11-year history. The hire of Sean Elliott replacing Trent Miles, who had just nine wins in four seasons. This is already win number six of the year for Georgia State to close out the year. A 39-21 Lending Tree Bowl victory over Western Kentucky. A football program that's trending in the right direction. Success is starting to become expected there on the regular consecutive bowl games and back-to-back -back seasons and getting the W. They got it going on in hot Atlanta with this Georgia State football team. Quad Brown finishing off his freshman season, his redshirt freshman season back in his home state getting his team a bowl victory, a six and four record. And a force to be reckoned with in the Sun Belt for several years to come, to be certain. We remind you to find your way to the ESPN app for our Capital One post game. Right after we go off the air, we'll have the trophy presentation, the awards from this game with Dawn down on the field. There will be disappointment tonight for Western Kentucky, to be sure. But there's also a sense of accomplishment for having worked their way through the most unusual college football season in several lifetimes. 39-21, the final score from Mobile, Alabama. Thanks so much for being a part of it. 
wherever you were today, hopefully your day a little bit better after watching this one. So on behalf of our entire crew, Don Davenport down on the field, my partner Jay Walker, I'm Mike Cousins saying so long. 39-21, Georgia State a winner. We say so long from Mobile. Coming up next, college football scoreboard.